Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Professor Paul Daly, University Research Chair in Administrative Law and Governance at the University of Ottawa. And I'm here today with Professors Liz Fisher and Sid Shapiro for the second edition in this year's Administrative Law and Governance Colloquium. The theme is the legitimacy of the state. The legitimacy of contemporary liberal democratic states is in a state of flux. Managing the effects of globalization, responding to the COVID-19 pandemic, and fighting escalating inflation, amongst other things, have prompted serious questions about public administration in the global north. These pressing issues have shone a spotlight on difficult areas for liberal democracies, which have struggled in recent decades to reconcile popular desires with the need for effective governance. In this year's Administrative Law and Governance Colloquium, speakers will address challenges to legitimacy in liberal democratic states by focusing on a range of institutions, the executive branch, the civil service, administrative agencies, immigration enforcement, and central banks. The overall goal of the series is to outline contemporary legitimacy challenges and likely responses. Last time out, we heard from Professor Margaret Cohn, and today we're joined by Professors Fisher and Shapiro. Liz Fisher is Professor of Environmental Law at the Faculty of Law in Corpus Christi College at the University of Oxford. She's also the General Editor of the Oxford Journal of Legal Studies and served as General Editor of the Journal of Environmental Law for a decade from 2012 to 2022. Her research explores the mental constructs lawyers and legal scholars use to legal reason, particularly in relation to public administration and environmental problems. Her work is grounded in national common law jurisdictions. She has won teaching awards and served as Vice Dean of the Law Faculty at Oxford and was awarded a Leverhulme Major Research Fellowship from 2022 to 2025 for a project exploring legal imagination and environmental law. Sid Shapiro is a professor of law at Wake Forest Law and the Frank U. Fletcher Chair in Administrative Law. Sid is an expert in administrative procedure and regulatory policy, written 10 books, contributed chapters to seven additional books, and has authored or co-authored over 55 articles. He has been a consultant to government agencies and has testified before Congress on regulatory matters. He's the vice president of the Center for Progressive Reform, a nonprofit research and educational organization of university affiliated academics. Prior to teaching, Professor Shapiro was a trial attorney with the Federal Trade Commission and deputy legal counsel of the Secretary's Review Panel at the US Department of Health, Education and Welfare. The way things are going to work today is that uh, Liz and Sid are going to engage in a conversation about their uh, important recent book on uh, reimagining um, administrative law uh, on the topic of administrative competence. I've asked them to speak a little bit about the discussion of expertise in the book, and I've asked them to discuss as well the recent Supreme Court of the United States decision in West Virginia and EPA, the so-called major questions doctrine case. Um, if you have questions along the way for uh, Liz and Sid, uh, please pop them in the, the Q&A um, and they'll respond. And if they don't respond, I'll, um, I'll uh, pop my camera back on and, and make sure they do. Uh, Liz and Sid, uh, thank you for joining me. Um, over to you. Sid, I think you're muted. <laughs> Well, there's a good start. Uh, first lesson of webinars, unmute. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, we're really uh, pleased to uh, to be here and tell you about our book and more broadly about the subject of expertise and administrative uh, governance. Um, so we're going to uh, do a bit of a conversation, and we're going to ask questions of each other to uh, to get that started. And uh, as Paul indicated, please join us uh, because you too can ask questions and don't wait till the end, although we'll take questions then. Uh, as we're talking and a question pops into your mind, uh, please uh, shoot that into the question and answer box. Uh, we should be able to uh, see that and we'll uh, stop and incorporate uh, and respond to your questions um, as we go. So Liz, um, we spent a long time writing a book uh, about administrative expertise. Uh, it was a labor of love, I think, for both of us, um, a very engaging project. Um, 
But it does sort of raise the question, uh, what is administrative expertise? And relatedly, obviously, why does it matter? Uh, fantastic. And can I just um, reinforce Sid's statement about putting questions in the chat? And please don't feel shy. This is a topic which, I th you know, we really are keen for people to think about it, to explore it. Um, and that is for, um, to, to kind of start with, and just to give you, here is the book that we're talking about, um, is that administrative law is the law of public administration. But interestingly, and this is where we really started this book, if you talk to administrative lawyers and you say, what is you know, what is public administration? They will usually say something like bureaucracy or technocracy, um, as if we all know what that is. And of course, public administration can be many things. And, and what we felt was actually um, administrative lawyers didn't often inquire behind these labels. Now, this is akin to, and some of you may have come across this great book, Michael Lewis's The Fifth Risk. Um, this was published, I think, in 2016. And in it, Michael Lewis was kind of reflecting on um, the incoming Trump administration at that time. Um, and many members of that administration had sort of said, well, we're going to get rid of government departments. And when someone asked them, you know, what, well, what does that government department do? They said, we have no idea, but we're going to get rid of it anyway. Now, administrative lawyers are not as an extreme example of that. But again, we have this problem that we have a subject which is meant to be about this institution, public administration, and yet we don't know, as administrative lawyers, a huge amount about it. So in the book, what we focus on is not all forms of public administration. We're particularly interested in expert public administration. And the reason for that is that expert public administration is probably seen as the most contentious form of public administration. In a democracy, to have experts making a decision seems undemocratic. And again, expertise is one of those words that public administra administrative lawyers sort of throw around but they don't define. So early on in the book, we think about, well, what is expertise and why is it important? And, and where we start is a story. And, and Sid, you're gonna have to help me here because I'm gonna mispronounce the name of the river in Ohio. Um, but we start with a story about burning rivers in the 1960s in Ohio. Um, and the rivers were burning because of poor water quality. Um, and in the 1970s, we see the passing of um, the Clean Water, what became known as the Clean Waters Act. But more importantly, we have the setting up of the Environmental Protection Agency. And it's really that agency and the coordinated expertise in monitoring water quality, understanding what contributed to water quality, which resulted in the Clean Waters Act being relatively successful. And in the book, we tell a story of a man who um, comes back to the river? He'd fallen into it in the 1960s. What the, said the name Cuyahoga. of the river is? Cuyahoga. You're excused. You're Australian. <laughs> okay, Cuyahoga River. He falls into the Cuyahoga River, and in the 1960s, you know, it, it's incredibly polluted. And when he returns, um, sort of 40 years later, it's clean. And he says it's a miracle. Um, and the point we make in this book is it's not a miracle. It's the product of legal and institutional commitment to cleaning up water. And it depends on the expertise of the EPA. So in chapter two of the book, we think about, well, what do we mean by expertise? Now, a common definition is to describe expertise as simply the sort of, you know, knowledge or experience that another arm of government doesn't have. But we break up expertise to show it means a range of things. So within an administrative body, such as the Environmental Protection Agency, you have many different types of experts. You have experts who are experts on, you know, biologists, ecologists, um, economists, um, the list goes on. And each of those experts has expertise where they're contributing to their area, but they also need expertise to interact with other experts. Um, 
And you also have within an administrative agency what we call meta expertise. So expertise, people who can bring together the knowledge and the expertise of different people within an agency. So that's the first type of kind of dimension of expertise, these, these kind of. The second type is that we tend to often think of experts as number crunchers, like a computer. Um, but of course, public problems are complex. They have many different dimensions. So working with them requires not so much a computer, but a kind of the exercise of judgment, the exercise of reason. Um, and this is what we call is akin to a craft, a kind of practical kind of reason. And we draw on the work of John Dewey. Now, all of this is not to say that expertise is the most wonderful thing ever, um, or to say, you know, you should always believe the experts. It's showing that when we're talking about public administration, we are talking about a set of thick institutional practices. Now, why that is significant um, is something that Sid's going to talk about. But what I wanted to do just before I handed it over to him is to explain how that contrasts with how we often think about expertise as administrative lawyers. So coming back to that description of expertise, you know, public administration as technocrats or bureaucrats, that's a kind of very thin description of sort of what an administrator does and expertise is often just thought of as knowledge and then people say oh well experts don't know that much so in actual fact it's just politics but if we have to think about contributory expertise interactional expertise meta expertise craft expertise we have to think about how knowledge is created and reliable knowledge is created um, and in the book, we use an example of where reliable knowledge is not being created. And that was um, in relation to John Wu, um, who, who, yes, um, you may remember who wrote the um, brief in relation to um, whether certain types of interrogation were torture after 9-11. And the interesting thing we find about that is he worked, for, he was seconded to the Office of Legal Counsel. Um, and he wrote very literalistic forms of advice. Um, and afterwards, he was criticised from all kind of sides of, of politics from administrative lawyers saying, this is not the type of expertise that you would ex expect to see in the Office of Legal Counsel. To be a government lawyer, you need to think more deeply about the problems that law applies to. So that's just an example of what we're of what the expertise we're talking about is not. But I'm going to hand over to Sid. Rose, before you do that, I've got another question. Um, yeah. So we've got all these different kinds of experts and different kinds of expertise. We've got John Yu. Um, and what you're really saying is they need to talk to each other. And when they talk to each other, then we create a conversation. And then from that conversation, uh, we need to have the expertise to figure out what to do. Um, how is it that they can talk to each other, uh, whether you're talking lawyer to lawyer or lawyer to chemist or lawyer to statistician? Um, so when, when you say how they can talk to each other, I presume you mean in, in, in the sense of what skills do they need to talk to each other? Yeah. Yes. So, so they need, in a sense, what, and this is interactional expertise, and you're quite right, I didn't explain it. This is expertise in interacting with others in other disciplines. And all lawyers, when we think about it, have mm -hmm. to be interactional experts because law is always applying to other problems and we need to know something about those problems. So um, part of the time I teach environmental law and you have to teach something about environmental problems because that is what the law is applying to. So, so it's it's recognizing that that, you know, it is really challenging. And I imagine there are people in the audience who, who, you know, find it can be challenging to talk to scientists, but you can develop expertise in that. Um, Sid, is that? Yeah. Okay, so the question is, what are the implications for administrative law? And I hand over to Sid. Um, so as we were thinking about this, um, it came to us, there's a reason why most American uh, administrative lawyers uh, don't know much about expertise. Uh, it's not too far 
inaccurate to say that agencies are just these black boxes. And for lots of years, we've been talking about administrative law. People have been writing articles about it. And no one has really looked inside the agency uh, to see what, what's going on. And the reason for that um, is that uh, administrative law was, and still is to a large extent, imagined as the way we constrain what agencies do. And in that narrative, in that view of what administrative law is, the object of law is to constrain the agency and make sure that it's operating in a lawful manner. And that relates to the way uh, Liz started um, our conversation, which is the challenge in a liberal democracy is we have decisions being made, at least initially, uh, by the people who work for government, the civil servants who are not elected. And that's largely influenced by this body of expertise. Uh, and how do we know that that is democratic and lawful? And that was the job of administrative law. And we take a sort of a fundamental uh, disagreement with that uh, because we all we see administrative law as having to do two jobs at once and together. And that is the way we capture that is we talk about the competence of administrative agencies. An administrative agency is competent when two things happen. One, it has the capacity to carry out the laws that Congress uh, told it to implement, and it has the legal authority to do what it wants to do. Um, and for us, because administrative law is the law of public administration, when you make decisions about agency uh, action, you have to keep in mind that the rules, the doctrines have to both foster the capacity of the agency to act and do what it needs to do, and at the same time, ensure that it's operating in a legal manner. And in a while, uh, we're going to talk about a couple of cases, Chevron and West Virginia versus EPA, and we'll show you how that operates. So I know this is a little vague right now. But the important point is uh, that uh, the law has not been, that it hasn't been recognized that this is also a function of the law. Um, the funny thing is, however, although it's not recognized as a function of the law, that the law has to ensure agencies are able to operate. The law has been doing that. Uh, we go back through the history of administrative law, and this has long been in the mind of administrative lawyers and scholars. And when you look at the case law, there is a whole line of doctrine, uh, doctrines that really foster uh, capacity and legality at the same time. It just wasn't recognized uh, that this was occurring. Well, why are we concerned that we foster capacity as well as uh, legality? Well, that's really part of the legitimacy of the administrative state, uh, that there are laws, they're passed by Congress, they're duly enacted uh, by uh, a legislature. And uh, to that extent, metaphorically, the people have spoken and they want that law to be implemented. Um, so it's got to be a function of law <laughs> to not only constrain, uh, but uh, to implement. And that's why we're interested in expertise. If the job of administrative law is to foster this competence as well as uh, authority, um, then it has to foster expertise. And that's where the two come together, that you can't foster capacity and exp uh, to, to carry out these missions unless you understand how expertise operates, because that's what law is supposed to be doing. It's supposed to be fostering the operation of this expertise. Um, I might just add, um, we're not the only folks talking about this. Uh, there's a small but growing literature that's beginning to, uh, to do this. Uh, there's a new book, uh, even newer than ours, uh, by William Araza, uh, who's at Brooklyn called Rebuilding Expertise. And he also does, uh, uh, he does a really good job of going inside and looking um, at both of these functions operating at once and explains how um, that is turning out. Um, 
So Liz, I'm just curious, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, you're now uh, in England, originally uh, from Australia. Um, and I've been talking about the implications of this insight for American administrative law. Um, does it have uh, implications? Thanks for, uh, Paul just put in the site uh, to, uh, to Bill's book. Um, does it have uh, implications for other jurisdictions? Is this important outside of the United States in England, Canada, Australia? Um, so so it, it does. Um, before I, I get there, I, I want to come back to a question for you. Um, and, and I guess, you know, so an important thing about our book is it is about American administrative law. And it is, um, and, and developing the book and writing about the book um, required us to delve deep into administrative law history in the US and it required us to de delve deep into administrative law doctrine in the US. And, and I think that does raise a question that often we think that, um, you know, public administration is everywhere so we can kind of, you know, just borrow stuff. But, but you know, a lot of what we discovered were the roots of kind of administrative law th thought back in the 19th century. Um, so so I, I will come back to the relevance for other jurisdictions, but um, what I wanted to kind of get further um, thought from you about is, as you say, I mean, one of the really exciting things we discovered was how much concerns with both capacity and authority were throughout that history. But we also found that, of course, there was this point where that focus on confidence disappeared, um, really, you know, in the 1970s. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. Um, sure. Uh, so uh, as Liz said, uh, we went way back, <laughs> in fact, to the founding. Uh, and we've looked at, and you'll see it in the book if you want, uh, writing about public administration um, for several centuries. Um, and uh, as said, uh, for the most part, people were thinking about how do we do this thing where we have to do both? And then uh, from about 1960 on, we started talking about constraint, which is where I started. And it was just about uh, constraint. Um, and there's a terrific irony here uh, because it was progressive scholars and lawyers that actually caused this turn of events. Um, and as we'll get into a little later in the talk, um, if you foster too much on constraint and you don't worry about capacity, then you don't build capacity. And that's the opposite of what these lawyers were seeking. So we're in the 1960s, Congress passes all of this legislation in the United States that it's still around, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, uh, which Liz described, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, the Consumer Protection Safety Act, uh, FDA, the Food and Drug Administration was given new uh, extended powers. There, there were lots and lots of improvements about health, safety, civil rights, uh, education, social welfare was expanded. We have all of this public law put in, public law created. And um, the progressives at the time, think Ralph Nader and people like him, they were very much concerned um, that when this went back to the agencies, they wouldn't do a very good job of implementing this or they'd be captured by industry and we wouldn't get the protections and the social benefits uh, that Congress intended. So their solution was, well, well, let's find doctrines that authorize us to enter these proceedings. We'll enter the proceedings, we'll hold the agency accountable, and if the agency doesn't do what it's supposed to do, we'll sue them and make them accountable. And in that way, we'll get good administrative government. Well, there's two things wrong with that. Um, as it turned out, uh, the public interest activists, activism in the United States is always outgunned by industry. 
uh, as perhaps it is in other countries as well. We'll ask that question to Liz in a minute. Um, so they simply weren't able to compete with the chemical companies and the drug companies and big agriculture uh, in these agency proceedings. There's simply too much money on the other side to compete. Um, the other problem is nobody worried about the capacity of agencies to do the job. They were just thinking about how do we sue agencies and make them do the job. But if you make them do the job, they still need the capacity to do that job. And so for a very long time, we weren't focused uh, on building and supporting doctrines that also supported uh, capacity. Uh, taking a law that existed and expanding it that already existed about capacity and running with it and expanding it. Um, and that's what we've been failing to do uh, and why I started by saying administrative law today seems to be about constraint. Um, so that's a very American story, Liz. <laughs> uh, what about elsewhere? Liz, I think you're muted. Well, 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 well Liz is, is wrestling with the um, the unmute button there, um, Sid. Um, would it be would it be fair to say that um, competence is something which is complex and difficult to build? Um, Congress can't just pass a statute and specify that the agency shall be expert it's something that has to be gained uh, has to be acquired as you uh, as you both said you both use the word fostered um so it's, it's a bit more complicated than just simply having a, a statute uh yeah thanks for that question um so liz was talking about the sociology of expertise uh and one of the surprising parts uh when we got into this uh, more deeply is how you know there's all these different kinds of expertises uh, there's the kind that we have to, to, to do the work itself. It's our ability to talk to people who do other kinds of expertise. It's gathering all this information and contribution and being able to um, put it together in some meaningful fashion. Uh, your question goes to yet another kind of expertise, um, which is institutional expertise in this sense. Um, FDA lawyers, have a different, and the people who work there have a different expertise uh, than the people who do Clean Water Act and the people who do Clean Air Act uh, to the people who do uh, antitrust work at the FTC. So it's not only that uh, you uh, have these general kinds of expertise, but they're honed in a specific area. And that that's a specific kind of expertise. So it's very complex fostering this throughout the government because you're really fostering literally dozens of kinds of specialized expertises um, at the same time. Um, so the John Yu story is a good example of this. Um, uh, professor Yu uh, was a law professor. He went into government uh, and then he went back to being a professor. Uh, and when he wrote this memo, he didn't really talk to anyone and he didn't ask anyone for their views. Um, and that's one reason that it sort of ran into trouble, uh, because how uh, this works out in uh, various areas of the armed services, the State Department, Foreign Service, there was a lot of different kinds of institutional expertises that had to be blended together to get a sensible policy. Um, and that was the, the part that he ignored. Liz, are you back? Nope. <laughs> Liz sent me an email to say that her mouse died, um, <laughs> um, which is a, a first. Um, I think I've had everything else happen uh, with uh, with Zoom, uh, but not uh, uh, not this one. Um, Sid, you can continue on that that theme if you want, um, and I'll, um, I'll I'll pretend to listen um, while I'm uh, while I'm working with Liz to uh, to get her back. Uh, Okay, uh, I think what I'll uh, do is um, jump ahead. Um, and we indicated that we were going to uh, give uh, 
a couple of examples of uh, how this has worked out uh, in the United States. Uh, and um, so I would like to talk about one case, uh, Chevron, and then um, we'll give uh, Liz the opportunity when she gets back on uh, to talk about West Virginia versus EPA. Um, and then we can go back to the implication for um, other jurisdictions. So um, I pointed out uh, earlier that one of the uh, interesting, if not surprising things, uh, when we started uh, looking deeply into American administrative law uh, is that uh, we found uh, case law supporting our view about competence, uh, that we need to worry about capacity of the agencies and legality at the same time. And perhaps the most important decision that did that and illustrates that uh, was uh, the Chevron decision. Um, and for that reason, perhaps it's also been one of the most controversial uh, decisions. So the, in the Chevron decision, uh, the Supreme Court was reviewing an EPA decision under the Clean Air Act. And uh, the agency had come up with this innovative policy about when you, you needed to get a permit uh, to add on to or remodel your factory. Uh, and they were doing that under a section of the, the uh, Clean Air Act, um, which said that you needed a permit uh, for uh, new stationary sources. And EPA said, well, you know, if you replace one source with another source and there's no net addition to air pollution, then uh, we think that statutory term is uh, satisfied. But it was ambiguous. Uh, it wasn't clear whether it authorized this uh, substituting one for the other or not. So uh, when Justice Stevens reviewed this uh, for the Supreme Court, he came up with a two-part test that the court used for years, perhaps until West Virginia case, which we'll talk about, uh, to review how administrative agencies interpret ambiguous or unclear statutory language. And the way he did it is he established uh, what he called a two-step test. And at step one, Stevens asked, has the Congress spoken clearly to the precise question the agency is trying to resolve, which was, can the agency adopt this substitute one for the other policy? And at step one, uh, if the Congress has spoken to the precise question at issue, then the case is over because Congress has made its decision. In other words, there are no ambiguous terms. It's not an ambiguous phrase. If, however, the term, the court, the judge, judges cannot find and the statutory language or history or goals of the statute, any clear indication of what Congress intended, then Justin Stevens said, we'll go on to step two. And at step two, we'll ask, well, how did the agency resolve this ambiguity? And is that a reasonable interpretation? of this ambiguous phrase. So in this case, there were two interpretations. You could interpret it the way EPA wanted, or you couldn't. <laughs> it was one or the other. And the court said, well, you could read it either way. It's, it's Both of those could be legitimate policies, but we think the agency is in a better position than the courts to decide which of these meanings, which are, after all are different policies, which of these meanings are the best policy? And so if the agency at step two has chosen a reasonable policy, the court said, we'll defer to it. We'll accept it as long as it's reasonable. So when you look at Chevron, you're going to see the operation of what Liz and I are talking about. At the first step, it's about authority. Has Congress decided the issue? But can I just and and can I 
First of all, can yeah, I just apologize? Yeah, welcome back. So, uh, yeah, no, so can I just that apologize, Mike? My... To, to Chevron, and we'll loop back to other jurisdictions. But, but, but can Please. I just come back to that question of authority in the first step? Because I yeah. think often people say the first step of Chevron is about law. And of course, and, and it's just a legal question. And of course, mm -hmm. we say, yes, it is a question about authority, but more a question about competence. So it's not just a literal interpretation. Um, in what sense? Know, well, in the sense that, so, so a common way to think about the two steps of Chevron is the first step is about law and the second step is just about deference to expertise. Right. Our argument is saying, even at the first step, a court needs to think about actually what is the capacity of public administration in relation to this question. You know, they are thinking about, is it clear on its face, has to, in a sense, take into account the institution that is making the decision. That will help provide clarity. So... Uh so we wrote the book together. Not surprising. I agree with you. <laughs> um, um, but for the audience, uh, what we're seeing at work here is this. So when you go to interpret a statutory phrase, right, um, there are various arguments. Obviously, the parties are going to have different arguments. It's never there. Are, sometimes it's crystal clear <laughs> what Congress meant. I mean, it's just clear. But there are other cases where you could decide, yeah, it's clear enough Congress spoke, has spoken, or I don't know, maybe they meant that, but I'm not quite sure. And that's where, uh, as Liz is pointing out, uh, we hope a judge would ask herself, um, well, how confident am I about Congress has spoken? And to answer that question, I really have to figure out what is the agency doing here and what is it trying to accomplish? Uh, because uh, there are going to be gray cases, and in the gray cases, uh, it's neither absolutely clear that Congress hasn't spoken, it's not absolutely clear they have spoken, it's somewhere in between, do I go to step two, or do I sort of run with step one, regardless that I probably could do this one way or the other. And then obviously step two is deferring to the uh, judges, and Justice Stevens says, well, there's two reasons for that. One, they're experts. <laughs> uh, I don't know anything about clean air. Uh, and two, uh, he said they're politically accountable. And in the United States, judges aren't. They have lifetime tenure. And so part of their decision, uh, part of their accountability is political. Um, so we're better off having them uh, make these decisions. In other words, uh, we're fostering the capacity of them to make decisions. Now, the reason this has been so controversial uh, is under the American system, constitutional system, the separation of powers. It's long been said and held that the courts make law, decide legal questions, and the other branches have other functions. Um, and so Chevron was criticized as soon as it came out, and the crescendo of criticism has only grown stronger. Uh, that uh, this is displacing the function of the courts in deciding what law means. Uh, that we're looking at statutory terms. That's a law. Judges decide what the law is. Therefore, judges should decide statutory terms. And therefore, when you defer to an agency and you say, well, there's a couple reasonable meanings, I'll let them choose which one. Well, then you're displacing the court's function and deferring to these unaccountable experts, these civil servants, uh, instead of giving the courts uh, this function. Uh, Stephen's answer to that, he didn't really answer that, um, but uh, the way that the literature has answered that is, yes, but at step two, the courts are still making the final determination of whether or not you've chosen one of the reasonable uh, choices. And if you haven't chosen one of the reasonable ways to resolve the ambiguity, then it's illegal. So the courts are still deciding legality but they're deciding it within kind of an umbrella or a space for 
competence to develop and operate. Um, so that's what Chevron uh, did. It's been controversial. And then there's been this recent decision in uh, West Virginia versus EPA where the court seems to pull back from that, if not overrule Chevron. So Liz, what did West Virginia versus EPA do? And has Chevron been overruled? Okay, um, so so just just to and an, um a fantastic um kind of discussion of Chevron and and just to reiterate reiterate what is different about our our argument is we are saying issues to do with administrative competence matter to both steps of Chevron. So the first step is the statute clear on its face? You have to have some understanding of administrative competence, and we give some illustrations from the cases. And the second step is not just full on deferring to public administration. As Stephen said, it has to be a permissible construction. So it is always a legal ex exercise. So how does West Virginia fit into all of this? Well, um, to explain how West Virginia fits into it, we need to go a little bit back in time to a case in 2000 called Brown and Williamson um, and Tobacco. And that was a case which involved the question of whether the Food and Drug Administration could regulate tobacco under the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. And that depended on whether tobacco fitted into the definition of drug. Now, um, in the book, we talk about the different judgments as that case went up through the courts. And it, it was a particularly tricky case to understand whether it was within the competence of the FDA. But the Supreme Court, in a majority judgment from um, Sandra Day O'Connor, ended up concluding that in actual fact, tobacco wasn't included because Congress never had intended to include it and there was other legislation. Um, it wasn't a particularly, um, as a kind of piece of doctrinal reasoning, it was kind of unique. And many poor people thought that it rested just on um, issues to do with tobacco. But of course, over time, what we've seen in the US is a growing emphasis on concerns about delegating power to administrative agencies. Um, and we've seen a kind of concern that Chevron does give too much power. Um, and of course, whether you think it gives too much power to administra administrative agencies depends on what you think public administration um, is expected to do. And I just want to read to you from another judgment from a couple of years ago called Gundy. Now, this is one of um, Justice Gorsuch's first opinions when he reached the bench. It was a dissent. But in it, he described what he thought public administration um, should be doing. So let me just read it. To determine whether a statute provides an intelligible principle. So he was concerned that statutes should provide intelligible principles for administrative agency. We must ask, does the statute assign to the executive only the responsibility to make factual findings? Do, does it set forth the facts that the executive must consider and the criteria against which, which to measure them? And most importantly, did Congress and not the executive branch make the policy judgments? Only then can we fairly say that a statute contains the kind of intelligible principle the constitution demands. Now, if you think about that, what he's saying is that the expertise of public administration is literally only in relation to a few very well described factual situations and finding those facts. Now, Gundy is a case, as I said, it was a dissent, but then we come to West Virginia and EPA. Um, now, there are some important issues about why the litigation was brought, the mootness of the issues. We don't need to worry about those here. The question for the Supreme Court was whether a certain provision of the Clean Air Act, under it, whether it was permissible for the EPA to pass rules in relation to basically encouraging what is known as generation shifting, the shifting from carbon intensive energy generation to lower generation under this provision and under the word. Now, that is actually, again, quite a tricky question to answer. You needed to look at the wording. And what we see is the dissent, Justice Kagan's a fantastic dissent, is a study 
of the Clean Air Act legislation, its history, looking at the organisational nature of the EPA. And as she concludes, this is looking at this act, you know, not only does it fall into the wording, but also it is clear as she describes it, that this kind of activity is clearly within the EPA's wheelhouse. But the majority um, ruled that in actual fact, that this piece of legislation, we don't even get to consider these kind of questions of statutory interpretation. Because where something is a major question, and I'll come to the definition of that at the moment, it needs to be explicit in legislation that an administrative agency has been explicitly delegated power to deal with that major question. Now, that does seemingly overrule Chevron. It's a kind of Chevron stop step zero. You say there are certain types of issues which are so controversial, they raise major questions, that unless the legislation is absolutely explicit, then that administrative agency cannot regulate on that topic. Now, going back to the tobacco case, one can see a kind of line between that case and West Virginia, and there's a few other cases in between. But really the assumption lying under it is a very thin vision of administrative expertise. Now, many have criticized this case on the basis that um, it of course thwarts action in relation to climate change. Um, but it's also problematic from a legal reasoning point of view. So the question is, what is a major question? And the court says it is a major issue of economic or political significance. Although it's not clear what that means. It's also not clear what the court means to say that an act is actually <laughs> explicit on its face. Um, and in a way, this is an example of why we argue in the book that thinking about administrative competence actually makes one more rigorous in your legal reasoning. West Virginia is sort of an opposite of that, but I'm gonna hand over to, to Sid to kind of follow on that conversation. And I'm not gonna mute myself because I'm very scared if I mute myself, I'll <laughs> never be unmuted. <laughs> uh, well, you can take these two cases, right? Um, Chevron and West Virginia and hold them up to each other. So in the Chevron case, uh, we have a novel policy decision, policy choice by EPA under a vague term that could be read that way. And the court says, uh, we're going to let them um, choose this policy and choose this as the best way of implementing the Clean Air Act. And we get to West Virginia, we have a novel way, a novel interpretation by EPA of a vague uh, phrase that could be read the way EPA read it. And the court is saying no, because this fits within this controversial political and economic rubric. It's a major question. And we're gonna assume the agency doesn't even have the authority to make that policy choice unless Congress clearly authorizes it. And that goes back to the dissent that Liz read you in Gundy, where Justice Gorsuch is saying it's up to Congress to resolve these issues, these naughty, controversial issues, uh, and not the agencies. And we're going to take these issues away from the agency. And when you do that, you're taking away the agency's capacity to solve major problems that it's trying to solve within its general jurisdiction. Um, so once FDA uh, discovered, which it didn't know for a long time, that the tobacco companies were actually manipulating uh, what went into a cigarette, they were pumping all kinds of chemicals, like 26 or 28 chemicals in a cigarette. Then it became uh, and fit within the definition of a drug, uh, because it was a very broad definition that said, well, anytime you're trying to manipulate the body by feeding it something, some sort of medicine or some sort of uh, instrument, it's a drug. Uh, 
So it literally fit that definition. The court says, no, that's kind of a new area, FDA. It's not clear whether Congress authorized you to do that. Same thing later uh, with West Virginia. So now this, this is really a kind of serious threat um, to the capacity of agencies. But let's flip it. So um, Gorsuch says, Congress has got to make these decisions. Well, Congress never makes these decisions. Right now, our Congress can't decide anything because <laughs> it's a gridlock. But even in the good old days, Congress itself recognized that it was unable to drill down uh, and acquire the same kinds of complex expertise that you find in the agencies because it is complex and it is complicated and uh, that kind of expertise will never rest in a legislative system. So um, as the dissent in West Virginia points out, what Congress does when it passes vague phrases and general jurisdiction is it's saying to the agency, you're a problem solving agency. And here's the range of problems we want you to solve. Looking down the road, we don't know what the next problem is going to be. But if it fits within this general rubric of the problems you're assigned to solve, we'll give you the jurisdiction to do that by generally authorizing you to solve problems. Um, and that's very much uh, in the Chevron. You're competent to do that. Tell us what you want to do. Solve this problem as opposed to the way the court's gone, which is uh, Congress can't authorize in any kind of general way agencies to be problem solving institutions. Uh, they have to operate under very strict, clear, precise congressional language, whatever that means and however that's accomplished. Um, and in effect, that's deregulatory because Congress isn't going to do that. So, um, you know, I'm, I don't know. Where do you think this is going to come out, Liz? So, so I, I mean, just, just to kind of reiterate, I agree it's deregulatory. I agree that there is a, an issue in the U.S. about Congress passing legislation. But to me, the other really significant part of this is it just results in really poor legal reasoning. So um, in the book, we use the idea about imagination and legal imagination. Um, and, you know, imagination needs to be grounded in reality. So if we go back, and this is why our discussion of expertise is so important. If we go back to Gorsuch's, Gorsuch's description of what he thinks an administrative agency can do, I can't think of any administrative body that does such a narrow set of tasks. Um, you know, administrative bodies under pieces of legislation in the US are delegated all types of activity. Um, and they have all kinds of institutional form. Um, and in a way, as lawyers, we need to ensure that that is relevant to our legal reasoning. And again, this comes back to Kagan's legal, you know, her dissent. I mean, what I think is so interesting about it is, like many of her other judgments, it's such a thoughtful study of kind of administrative competence. Um, but that's not the question you asked, Sid. The question is, where do we go from here? I am terrible at predictions. Um, I mean, strictly speaking, in a way, this West Virginia has not overruled Chevron. It only applies where there are matters of extreme political and um, legal significant, economic or political significance, whatever that is. But it does raise a concern about the direction of travel of doctrine and, and what this might mean for Chevron. I don't know if you've been following that at all. Uh, yeah, it's hard to tell as well, uh, because we don't know uh, whether the court is going to adopt a very expanded definition of the major questions doctrine, or it's going to leave it for uh, the kinds of issues that did arise in EPA, um, where uh, the court really, uh, or the agency EPA really was making a fundamental change necessary because of climate change, a fundamental change uh, in uh, how uh, we do environmental protection in a certain area of the Clean Air Act. So that was really a pretty major fundamental change that affected uh, the entire U.S. economy. Um, so if the court uh, limits uh, itself to a few issues, 
uh, like that, then um, perhaps not much will change. Um, I think there's probably a split uh, on the court. Um, Gorsuch and others probably want to turn this into exactly the narrow kind of uh, situation we were describing. Uh, I'm not so sure that the chief uh, and others will go along with that. So stay tuned. Um, let's look back uh, if we can. Um, we've been talking a lot about America. Um, what does this all have to do with other jurisdictions? So the first thing um, is, and, and this is going to seem rather obvious, but with whatever legal culture one is in, you need to take the legal doctrine seriously. You know, so, so part of this and part of what we're doing in this book is we are going back and looking at cases and, and really sort of seeing things in them which haven't been seen before. Um, and that's important because in, in nearly all jurisdictions, we tend to think that in administrative law, the choice is between law or administration. Um, a classic example of this is Harlow and Rawlings' wonderful, wonderful textbook, um, Law and Administration, where from the first edition, they chart two different styles of public law scholarship. Red light theorists, who tend to see that, you know, the task of administrative law is to, to kind of limit government. And green light theorists, who see that the choice is about enabling government. And what we're saying is, well, actually, if you, if you look at the law, if you look at doctrines, if you look at what's going on, those two things are going on at the same time. Now, I think it's important to stress that Harlow and Rawlings also recognise that. So it's not that we're saying their thesis is wrong. They're capturing the kind of debate. But, but our book is showing that, you know, yes, but both these things matter at the same time. And we can see that in the doctrine. So that, that's the first, I think, really important point. The second point, which follows on from that, is that that then leads to a deeper and more kind of um, thicker understanding of law. So a classic, in most jurisdictions, the classic story of administrative law is originally there wasn't really much public administration, although in our book we show that's not quite the case that one thinks it is, that originally most public administration was just about protecting private rights, but as the 20th century kind of progressed, it got far more about delivering public goods to the people. It was far more about kind of public functions and public service. But a lot of those accounts, including in Richard Stewart's very famous, The Reformation of American Administrative Law, treats law as an instrument for achieving outcomes. And we recognize that yes, that, that is important, but what's important is to see that the, the way in which law is expected to achieve those outcomes is by ensuring the capacity of a public administration. Now, capacity is not just letting public administration do what it likes. It's, it's about saying that in reasoning for public law to deliver on the things we expect of it, we need to think about how capacity is being exercised. So th this, I would argue, and people like Martin Lachlan back in 1992 argued that in many ways our understanding of public law when it came to delivering public functions was impoverished. Our book is sort of saying, no, actually, it's not as impoverished as we think it is. Um, and then the third thing, and, and I am um, coming back, is, is really also seeing administrative law within the context of what is it that we expect of administrative government. Um, so in the book, we quote from David Simon. David Simon wrote the script for The Wire, for Treme, for other um, things. And um, in an interview, he said the following. We the people are the government. It's either that or it's all over. If we're not the government, then philosophically, the American experiment is over. Yes, it's a constant struggle to diminish the effects of bad governance. That's an unending, unyielding, never ending fight. But that's democracy. That's the job. So in this book, we are not pretending that public administration can ever be democratic. Otherwise, it wouldn't be public administration. But we're showing that this kind of concern about competence, concern about both capacity and authority, that's in a sense the never-ending job of democracy. Um, and you know, 
democracy is different in England, in Australia, in New Zealand, in Canada, from America. But, but, but this is very much, you know, this kind of exercise of taking the law seriously is, is part of that. So they're, they're kind of a set of general things. I don't know what you think about that, Sid. Um, so what I hear you saying, and tell me whether uh, this is right or wrong, um, that our countries are uh, different. They have different legal cultures. Uh, we have separation of powers. Everybody else doesn't. Um, but despite that, uh, when you drill down into legal doctrine, uh, you see the same things going on that we cover in our book. Uh, they're different, obviously, because the doctrines are different. The implementation is different. But at bottom, it's still about uh, fostering competence and legal authority. Is that an accurate statement? Um, yes. And, and, and in a sense, the way to see that they're the same means that you need to take the differences between legal cultures seriously as well. Um, Do you so, think other jur... Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, yeah, you go. Do you think other jurisdictions, Canada, uh, the UK, uh, for example, uh, take expertise more seriously than we do in America? Um, so I don't know about Canada, and I can I'm, I'm going to defer to the I'm we'll ask Paul. To, to, to Paul, <laughs> but let me let me take. So the UK is interesting because the UK um, has never historically built the kind of expertise within public administration that you see in the United States. Um, and that has been for a couple of reasons. Historically, if we go back to the 19th century, the idea of the civil permanent civil service was based on it being generalist um, and a kind of idea that actually, if you're an expert, you get too narrow-minded. Um, and so if, if you look at grades in the British civil service, expert people who are scientists are on a different grade structure and a different kind of career structure. So that's one reason. The, the second reason was this kind of, um, in a sense, a, a kind of scepticism about expertise. Um, a common saying is experts should be on tap, they should not be on top. Um, and that you can also see in the different structures of um, the kind of British civil service. The central government tends to be quite generalist and then you have these kind of committees, et cetera. But, but with that said, there is no doubt that expertise is running as a theme through British administrative life, often in really complex kind of ways. Um, so, so it is very different. And of course, we don't have administrative agencies in the way that the US has. Um, but the same kind of way of, and, and what I would also say is very similar, is that when a judge comes to judicially review a decision, they may not have the Chevron doctrine, but they are always thinking about the nature of the institution that they are reviewing. And there is no doubt that that um, shapes their legal analysis. And, and um, for example, for those, if we've got any um, kind of English administrative lawyers in the room, um, have a look at a decision like Privacy International, which is a major decision um, about um, ouster clauses. Um, and the different judges in that case describe, in a sense, the competence of the body under review, the Investigatory Powers Tribunal, in slightly different ways, with slightly different expertise. And, and that, in a sense, shape how they come to review it. So, so it is very different. Um, but I do think that the, the, the idea of taking the institutions that one is review a court is reviewing seriously is the same. But I'm going to hand over to Paul. Well, I don't want to spoil the uh, the discussion. I think there's a lot. Uh, uh, Canadians do have a lot in common, certainly with the Americans. And if you go back and look at the uh, the early Canadian state um, after uh, Europeans uh, arrive in Canada, immediately there's there's regulation. Immediately there's uh, there are governance structures. Even the the fur traders who went out to the interior to catch uh, 
uh, to catch beaver or to trade with uh, with, with uh, the indigenous peoples, that was heavily regulated, um, often by prerogative. But there were licensing schemes which required them to uh, deposit money, uh, sureties uh, as they went off, uh, regulations about when they could uh, travel, where they could where they could go, and so on. So similarly to the United States, state capacity um, is actually uh, has deep uh, historical roots, much deeper than is uh, is commonly imagined. Um, I think the the Canadian experience with expertise is a little bit different from the British. There's been uh, more openness towards uh, expertise, certainly on the part of the courts and, and probably in, in, in societal terms more generally. Uh, there may be a bit more uh, trust in in experts historically and uh, and even still today, um, but it, it's very interesting to uh, to listen uh, and to, to to muse on the the parallels. One question, uh, one. Oh, well, well, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, can, I, can I just push back on the word trust? Because I think um, I, I, might... I, I, I was seeing I, I saw the word in front of me and I thought maybe I shouldn't use it. Um, and then I, uh, you know, uh... um, and, but just just to, to, to make clear what our book um, is, is kind of not doing. What we're not doing is saying we trust the experts. They're lovely. <laughs> You know, what, what we're saying is this is what descriptively goes on. These are the institutions being built. And if administrative law is going to be a law of public administration, it needs to, in a sense, think about that kind of capacity and, and, and think about reason and ensure that kind of capacity. Now, that is about saying expertise is important, but it's not necessarily trust, trusting that expertise if that makes sense. I don't know if, Sid, you want to add? Yeah, I, so uh, we talk about lots of things in the book uh, besides Chevron, and one of them is just general review of uh, the decisions of administrative agencies. And what we think um, judges ought to be asking themselves uh, is not whether I think the agency got it right, um, you know, are the experts correct? But whether they seriously engaged their expertise uh, in an open and accountable fashion uh, with uh, taking into account lots of viewpoints uh, and differences of opinion. And did that process, did they use that as the process to arrive at the answer um, they arrived at? Uh, and that that's really the question for the courts, because in that way, uh, they're certainly ensuring uh, a legal authority uh, because our Administrative Procedure Act says uh, agencies can't act in an arbitrary and capricious way, uh, and that's the way you adjust that. But they're also promoting um, competence. They're saying, you know, we're going to accept your decision when you use your expertise in reasonable and justifiable ways, and we're not when you don't. Um, and good evidence uh, that the courts actually may be asking that question um, came up in the Trump administration. So the, um, I don't know if your listeners uh, followed this. It's rather astounding. Um, but um, administrative agencies uh, win um, somewhere around historically two thirds of their cases, 65, 75 percent of the time they prevail. Um, and I tell my students that's not by accident. It's because the lawyers who work for the administrative agencies are really quite good. And they understand uh, what they need to do and what the agency needs to do. And there's a thoughtful and expert uh, administrative process behind the decisions. And courts generally uh, find that persuasive. The Trump administration lost about 90% of their cases on appeal. So we went from winning. 75% or so to losing 90%. So how can that be? <laughs> well, as well known, uh, the Trump administration wasn't famous for its regard for expertise or even uh, the civil servants. Um, and so at most of these agencies, they just shortcut them, the process. They took them out of the equation. Uh, the rules were either written by uh, industry lobbyists uh, or at the top of the agency. And agencies simply didn't engage in the kind of deep use of expertise and discursive conversation that they were supposed to. Uh, 
And across the board, uh, judges appointed by Republican presidents and judges appointed by presidents who were Democrats, across the board, all of those panels saw that and said, no, uh, we're not going to approve this. Um, so although um, the Trump administration attempted to be deeply uh, deregulatory, um, they couldn't overcome uh, the original record for the regulation that was put in the place in the first place, because that was based on expertise uh, of the kind we're talking about. And then they came along and said, no, we're just not going to do that anymore. <laughs> and the court said, well, that's not using this deep expertise we explained. It's not using anything except ideology. And they turned them down. Um, so uh, there's some reason to think that the courts, in fact, uh, at some level, do engage in what we're uh, what we're talking about. I just I, I should just say um, that the when the Supreme Court of Canada reformulated its administrative law doctrine in 2019, it really switched from a model of presumed expertise on the part of decision makers to a model where decision makers have to demonstrate that they applied their expertise to a particular issue. And they have to demonstrate that through their reasons. Um, and that, um, I think, uh, in, in your uh, framework, uh, would yeah. be uh, an example of, uh, of courts uh, promoting uh, the uh, promoting uh, competence and, uh, and capacity. Um, I should say, uh, if anyone has any questions, you uh, you can pop them in the the Q and A. The discussion's been rattling along at such a clip that uh, it's uh, it, it's hard to uh, it might be hard to um, pop a question. Uh, but do do if you oh, want. Oh, good. Yeah, um, you know we're professors. If we could see you, we'd call on you. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're doing so, well. So Ephraim asks, uh, one normative criticism of administrative expertise or bureaucratic rationality, negatively put, is that it reduces the ends of the agency and shelters those ends from public accountability. The concern here is that administrative expertise in practice only allows its means to be appraised while immunizing its ends from appraisal under the guise of expertise, even in situations where those ends could reasonably be thought to undermine the broader public interest. What would you, uh, what would you say to that? Um, um, so, ahead, I think, yeah, so, I mean, that's a classic critique and it's a, you know, it's, it's a kind of serious critique of, of expertise and I can, we can think of examples during COVID of, of that. Um, I think two things, one is that, um, you know, we often think that expertise makes one immune from critique, but anyone who is an academic knows that being evaluated is part of the job. So actually within expertise, and this is a chapter in the book, we talk about ways in which experts kind of critique each other. And so just because one is doing something as an expert does not mean that they're not accountable. But that doesn't, I mean, coming back to this kind of question, that there's a kind of subsidiary issue about experts being isolated. Um, and, and, you know, you can have a group of people kind of just as we have group think in politics, we can have group think in expertise. And there, of course, you know, that's where interactional expertise becomes very important. Now, none of that is guaranteeing that all decisions from expert administrative agencies are either one necessarily the right ones, although we would say the rigor of that process guarantees it, but two, more, um, I, I think importantly, that their decisions are not controversial. You know, um, Lewis Jaff once said, you know, the thing about public administration is it's the complete mirror of our people and it awakes resentment and it creates winners and losers. And so much of administrative law is about that fact. So, so in thinking, you know, decisions of expert, expert decision makers, you know, there's a question about are they legitimate in terms of administrative law? Are they decisions everybody's going to be happen, happy with? That's another um, aspect. But Sid, I'm sure you've got thoughts on this. Um, well, I, I would say uh, this. Um, yeah, I think that tendency is out there. Um, and I think agencies are prone to it uh, because um, they like to hide behind what they call the science. Um, so um, it's a very political thing to do uh, to fend off criticism. Uh, to say, well, the science was clear. I'm just doing what the experts say. 
Um, in fact, the science typically is never that clear. And there are always policy choices to uh, be made at the end of the day, uh, including how reliable is the science, uh, which is not a scientific question. Uh, and the agency uh, needs to explain and justify itself uh, in terms of the policy choices it makes instead of uh, fending this off on uh, the science. Um, so I think uh, it sounds like in Canada and maybe hopefully in the United States, we're making them do that. Uh, and if we make them do that, uh, then I think we're not quite as prone to what the questioner reasonably asked. That's a great question. Uh, that uh, we're, we're, we're holding them, uh, they're getting away with this, so to speak. And, and just following on from that, there was the paper that we did a couple of years ago, Sid, about COVID and looking at how, you know, what was really interesting during COVID in administrative bodies is that expertise was being used in the way that you were describing, but at the same time, it was being undermined, it was being contracted out, it was being disconnected, you know, so so in a sense, you know, there is another story here. Where, I mean, a lot of what we've talked about today is on the role of the courts, but there are also questions about how does, you know, once you, you see this kind of thick expertise, is how do you, in a sense, create structures within administrative bodies? And, and COVID, I think, uncovered a whole lot of um, kind of problematic kind of practices in different jurisdictions. Yeah, I, one thing... Um, um... We, we point out um, is there are these two disciplines and uh, they really don't talk to each other. So we have law and we have administrative lawyers or public lawyers. And then we have the discipline of public administration, uh, which are the people who train the managers and how the managers are trained to run the government. And uh, in public administration, they're very concerned uh, with what Liz was just talking about which is how do we best structure agencies uh, to produce this kind of thick and complex and discursive expertise? Uh, what's the best form of doing that? To what extent should you hire out scientists? To what extent should you have advisory bodies? Uh, those are really important questions about capacity. Um, and we um, lawyers have said, oh yeah, but that's public administration. Uh, because that's not about law, uh, right? Well, I suppose narrowly it's not about law, but we think of law in a much broader fashion, and that really is about law, because uh, all those structures are created by law at the end of the day. Uh, so we structure the agencies using law, and we ought to be interested in uh, what works and what doesn't work, uh, and what legal structures, uh, not only legal doctrines, but legal structures, uh, foster uh, the kind of expertise that um, is really necessary. On that note, um, I think that uh, quite nicely encapsulates the uh, the major theme of uh, your remarkable uh, your remarkable book. Um, like I say, uh, it's a uh, a very uh, a very fine piece of work, administrative Thank confidence, you. reimagining administrative law. I found uh, a lot of of interest in it, even as uh, it's certainly about the United States, but I think there are many insights which are uh, transferable to uh, to other jurisdictions. Um, so thank you both for uh, for the book and uh, and coming along to uh, to talk it through with uh, with me. Um, so Sid uh, and Liz, Professor Shapiro, uh, Professor Fisher, uh, it remains only for me to, to thank you. Um, you've been uh, uh, wonderful guests, um, and uh, I'm certainly very grateful for the, uh, the thought-provoking discussion that uh, you engaged in today. It was a, a privilege to be part of it. So uh, thank you both very much. Thank uh, you. You're quite welcome. For... Um, all right, Liz. <laughs> apologies for my mouse again. Well, uh, everyone has had uh, problems with mice uh, at some point in their lives. Uh, <laughs> there's nothing, nothing wrong with that. Um, so thank you. Thank you both again very much. Um, the yeah. next uh, in this series will be uh, on March 7th with uh, Professor Joseph Heath from the University of Toronto, um, who will be talking about uh, his book, The Machinery of Government. Um, so thank you both again very much. Um, all the best. Thanks for the audience for listening. We appreciate it. Thank you very, very much.